Hello everybody, and just to reiterate what I put in the community section of the channel, a few of the upcoming 5 minute guides and a few of these dry docks may sound a little bit congested uh, vocally, and that's because I'm fighting off an ear, nose and throat infection, but I don't want you guys to miss out on your regular content, so apologies if my voice sounds a little bit more nasal or it sounds like I'm fighting for breath at the end of a sentence. Anyway, Sean She asks, how do you reline naval guns? Uh, is it relining the actual naval rifle, or is it uh, scraping the barrel out or making a new one? And the answer is, it basically, it depends on the gun. There are two main ways of doing it. The simplest option is just simply to go into port, lift the roof off the turret, and get the gun out, and replace it with a brand new gun, where the gun's all been built up as a single unit. Um, alternatively, and uh, the US Navy did a fair bit of this uh, along with some other navies, uh, there is the option to have a detachable liner. Now obviously that brings an extra degree of complexity and another point of failure on the gun, so it's a little bit more of an ambitious thing than replacing the whole gun, because you've got more things that can go wrong at sea. But assuming that it works relatively well, it does save you a lot of time and money in the long run, because you can just attach the liner, pull it out, and insert a new liner. I mean, obviously it's a lot more complicated than that, but, it's, uh, but you get the general idea. No one would try and scrape out the interior of an existing gun unless they were completely reboring it for a new calibre, which uh, the Italians did to upgrade some of their older World War I dreadnoughts in between the wars. Tamenga88 asks, which ships were given the silliest nicknames? And uh, he cites Renown and Repulse being nicknamed Refit and Repair. This'll be good. So there's quite a lot, but some of my favourites are um, HMS Furious, Glorious and Courageous were at one point nicknamed uh, Curious, Spurious and Outrageous by the Royal Navy who didn't really value their fighting capacity all that much until they were converted into carriers. With a very large fleet and a lot of British humour going around, you can imagine the Royal Navy has quite a few good ones. Um, some of my favourites in the Royal Navy, apart from those three, include HMS Cornwall, which was known as the Fighting Ice Cream. The slightly not safe for work HMS Beaver, known as Her Majesty's Beaver. HMS Glamorgan, known as the Glamorous Organ. The King Edward VII class, known collectively as the Wobbly Eight. HMS Liverpool, known as the Crazy Red Chicken. HMS Nelson and Rodney, known as Nelson and Rodol. HMS Renown had a secondary nickname as the largest destroyer in the fleet. HMS Resistance and Old Ironclad had the nickname of Old Ramo. Problems finding an adequate main armament for HMS Scylla meant she was known as the Toothless Terror. HMS Vanguard was known as the battleship with her great aunt's teeth, and HMS Vengeance was known as the Lord's Own. But let's not leave other navies out of it. Uh, the Soviet ship, well, submarine, I guess, K-19, after suffering a major reactor incident, was brought back and uh, nicknamed Hiroshima by its uh, later crews. USS Carl Vinson apparently picked up the nickname of the Battlestar, USS John F. Kennedy got the nickname of Can Opener after hitting, as you might guess, a small American warship. And after three collisions in a year, the USS Kearsarge apparently acquired the nickname Ramin Rankin's Crash Barge. At least two ships in the Australian Navy have been named the Fluffy Duck. The Canadian ship HMCS uh, Nipigan has been named the Trawler Mauler. I'm presuming there's some kind of story behind that one. So yeah, if anyone has any further ones, feel free to add them in the comments. It's always uh, quite fun when you come up with odd and wonderful uh, ship nicknames. Graham Baxter asks, which modern naval service, that's 19th or 20th century, would you consider to have the best and or worst working conditions? Well, for worst working conditions, it's going to be a tie between the early 20th century Brazilian Navy, where much of the crew were quite literally treated as slaves, and they ended up having a full-on mutiny and revolt about it, which at least a good portion of their politicians, when they heard about it and realised what was going on, actually went 
yeah, they've got a point. And how often do you uh, find politicians thinking the people who have just rebelled against them and pointed massive naval rifles at them have a point? Um, so yeah, if, if do not be a regular crewman on a uh, Brazilian warship in the early part of the 20th century. Fortunately, they have gotten somewhat better than that. Um, the other contender, I would say, is probably going to be 1930s and 1940s Japanese Navy. Um, for the crewmen, well, they did get a bit of the short end of the stick, but they weren't as bad as the Brazilians. Uh, the reason I nominate the Japanese Navy for that is if you're an officer, um, well, for those of you who have seen Star Trek, the whole sort of Klingon promotion style thing that you get in Star Trek where it's, you can just uh, challenge your superior to a fight and stab them to death and then you're in charge... The Imperial Japanese Navy wasn't too far off of that uh, point, so where you, you you had genuine situations where various officers who didn't like each other or wanted a certain promotion were actively taking contracts out to assassinate each other. Um, when, you, when your naval service is in the business of killing its own officers through internal power struggles... You probably don't want to be an officer in those circumstances unless you happen to own a lot of bulletproof clothing and a, 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 you're an excellent shot yourself. In terms of best working conditions, well, it's going to be a toss-up between the American and British navies, and that's mainly just down to the operational realities of things. Uh, both navies had to operate ships at ex ex increasing ranges, um, the Americans obviously, obviously having to operate across the Pacific, the British having to operate globally, and as a result, it, apart from anything else, it was just a simple question of mathematics. If you have crew confined to very small, confined spaces, their efficiency and ability to work will drop off quite dramatically over long voyages. If you have slightly bigger spaces and a bit more room for them to move around a few more options then your crew efficiency stays higher for longer and when you're on long journeys uh, voyages across the world and such you need that as a matter of military necessity so the reason i say it's a toss-up is basically what comes down to well what did you value the most um, if you're in the royal navy you'll get alcohol and possibly the ability to loot minor countries every so often. If you're in the US Navy, unfortunately you don't get alcohol, uh, at least at this period for most of it. Um, we're talking about the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, but on the other hand, you are more likely to have things like ice cream and air conditioning, which the British Navy wasn't known for. So uh, pay your money, take your choice, really. Napalm Ratter asks, how well did rivals of in the Second World War, know the capabilities of their opponent ships. For example, did American ships know that they had a zone of engagement where they were immune to shell fire from a given Japanese ship, uh, but they had a chance of punishing through their opponent's armor, etc., etc.? Generally speaking, most navies had at least a semi decent idea about what they were facing, and that came in two parts. I mean, prior to World War II, when you talk about sort of the World War I period and earlier, nations tended to be very free and open with this kind of information they've made quite a lot of political hay and boasting about it in newspapers and such so it could quite simply be the case of picking up a newspaper or a souvenir cover from the ship's launch and you could find out almost everything you needed to know about the enemy warship but as uh, the 20th century progressed people tended to get more and more secretive about these things um, however with the treaty limits in place, you still had to announce certain things about your ship to make sure you were in on the displacement limits. Obviously, various nations did lie about that, but the various navies obviously all had very experienced ship constructors, so if you gave them the dimensions of a given ship, uh, its various proportions of how fine its bow was, etc., and how fast it was supposed to go, and its armament just from those details using the same equations they used to design their own ships most navies naval architects could sort of reverse engineer an enemy ship to a certain degree um, to work out what its performance characteristics should be the two biggest things that were a little bit more open to interpretation were things like armor thickness because unless you actually physically got on board the ship, you'd be hard-pressed to verify that that's exactly how thick it was. Um, and obviously, again, you could try and reverse-engineer the amount of weight that should be in armour, but 
you'd be mostly relying on intelligence service reports for that because obviously if they'd lied about the weight the calculations would all be wrong and the other thing was performance of guns so obviously unless they were publishing the results of the gun tests it was mostly a case of just looking at the guns and trying to work out from that how uh, they should perform based on what was known about the shell characteristics and the size of the gun. So if you saw, uh, say, a 50 caliber gun, you knew that it was probably a high velocity gun and might have better armor perform piercing characteristics, um, but they would be very much relying on their calculations based on their own guns. So things could vary quite extensively, but g generally they had a reasonable idea about the performance of the enemy ships because hard physical limits on things like uh, shell performance and uh, armor thickness uh, were a thing that everybody had to abide by. Of course one of the most notable exceptions to that was the Yamato which was built in such a degree of secrecy that they genuinely didn't have any idea really what these ships were uh, but they were just that's why, amongst other things, the American approach is just throw as many aircraft as possible at it and we hit it with enough bombs and torpedoes and eventually it'll sink and we can work out the finer details later on. Philip Juiced asks, why the British didn't revert to building heavy cruisers after the treaty limitations fell away? Well, obviously, before the treaty limits fell away, there were hard limits on the numbers of heavy cruisers they could build, but once the limits were gone... They strongly considered building a number of heavy cruisers. Um, there's quite a lot of extensive design studies that survive, and that ranged from sort of repeat upgrades of the County Dash Kent class with your eight twin, with your eight inch guns in four twin turrets, um, to something that more closely resembles what we think of as the classic heavy cruiser with three triples, all the way up to various supercruiser designs including the some semi-famous uh, 12 9.2 inch guns in uh, three quad turrets uh, there are a couple of designs for uh, six 12 inch guns in three twins uh, and everything else in between uh, the main thing was though that by the time the treaty limits lapsed the british had concluded that within the within the treaty restriction of 10,000 tons they preferred to build the town class and the various successors to that and once the once it became clear that there were various heavy cruisers like the hippers and the Megamis that were well in excess of the treaty limits world war ii was basically on the cards and or started at which point it was much easier to build various repeat iterations on the town so you got things like the crown colony class it was just easier to keep going with those than it was to stop everything, come up with a new design, build that, and obviously have to manufacture a bunch of 8-inch guns. And by the time everything had calmed down enough for them to consider building uh, heavy cruisers again, sort of towards the end of the war, the uh, increased anti-aircraft threat meant they were much more interested in having dual-purpose main armament, and no one had quite cracked a dual-purpose 8-inch gun at that point, so they went with designs that were more along the lines of auto-loading 6-inch guns, which would be the Neptune and Minotaur design studies, which uh, unfortunately would be dropped. You did end up with the Tigers, but they were pretty small and pathetic compared to what you could have got. Midnight2142 asks, what if the navies of either the Allies or Axis had swapped oceans? Uh, so like Royal Navy in the Pacific, American Navy defending the British Isles, etc, etc. Okay, so I'm going to assume it's just the navies themselves uh, rather than the nations. But, so if we have a look at, say, the Axis ones, because they're probably the easier to run, and we're going to assume that the swap is either Axis Navy swap or Allied Navy swap, because uh, both both sides swapping at once is just going to be too difficult. Um, so if the Kriegsmarine swaps places with the Imperial Japanese Navy, the Japanese are going to wonder p which particular god they so thoroughly ticked off as to visit them with this particular curse, because in the Pacific you need carriers and they have a half-completed Graf Zeppelin and that's it. So good luck with that chaps um hope you don't mind the u.s navy raining death and destruction from the skies on you for the rest of time because basically at this point they've got a small fleet 
that's partly rigged around commerce raiding versus an American Navy whose base in Pearl Harbor is now effectively untouchable except for potentially sticking a U-boat squadron out the front. Um, yeah, the, the, the Japanese would not be thanking you for this particular scenario. Meanwhile, uh, back in Germany, the, uh, the Kriegsmarine would be probably rejoicing to have the uh, Japanese Navy pop up in place of the Kriegsmarine. I mean, they've got, now they have carriers, they have battleships, they have cruisers, they have destroyers, they have everything they could possibly want. I suppose right up until they sail into the North Sea in the middle of a storm, at which point half the destroyers and cruisers are likely to keel over um, due to their lightweight construction. <clears throat> but outside of that, um, they've, they've now got a much bigger strike force, obviously. Um, the Yamato is not going to be complete at the time of the swap, assuming this is 1939, but uh, so much for that. Uh, it's going to tie down the Royal Navy an awful lot more because uh, there's now six battleships and plus the Congos, depending on how you want to define them. Um, it's a lot closer and uh, you might, if actually to be honest, with the Nagatos in place, you might well see the Lion class actually completed, which would be a rather interesting counterfactual. Um, the, but Germany has a lot more potential to strike out the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy is probably actually going to be significantly, significantly more constrained. They're probably going to ask for the, uh, with the Italian fleet operating still in the Mediterranean. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a very interesting, I think, I think I might actually have to do a video on that. Looking at the Allies swapping over, um, if the Royal Navy is now having to fight in the Pacific, their main problem is going to have to be learning how to do resupply at sea very quickly. Historically, the Royal Navy was a bit slow on the uptake for this one because they didn't have to because they had so many overseas bases that they could restock from. But uh, yeah, they're going to have to learn how to resupply at sea if they're going to fight in the Pacific. The first carrier battles, things like Coral Sea and Midway, are likely to be better for the Allies in terms of ship losses, worse for them in terms of overall outcomes, because the Royal Navy's carriers, with their smaller strike groups, aren't going to be able to inflict anywhere near the same amount of damage on the Japanese that the American carrier strike groups were able to. And to be fair, uh, no matter how well it performed in various situations in the European theatre in the early war, I do not want to send a bunch of swordfish up against uh, a full fleet of uh, zeros. That's just a hiding to nothing, really. On the other hand, um, a lot of the bomb hits that did in some of the American early war losses, as like Lexington and Yorktown, are probably not going to trouble most of the British carriers all that much. And uh, as for the torpedo hits... The British carriers were incredibly good at dodging, um, like almost supernaturally good at dodging uh, when it came to be having torpedoes dropped on them. Uh, apart from anything, just look at how, and I know it's not a carrier, but look at Repulse, uh, the uh, foresaid engagement. Uh, they had to do a full-on pincer drop with multiple aircraft just to get a single hit in on the thing. So you're probably actually, ironically, going to end up with some kind of surface action being fought because neither side's carrier strike groups are likely to be able to make a decisive uh, blow, especially with the once the RN realises that their strike power isn't really that great, they're probably going to start emphasising more and more on the fighters um, and just try and hold off the incoming Japanese aircraft rather than counter-strike. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's probably going to be some kind of big surface action to decide the outcome of one or the other invasion. Swapping the US Navy into the British areas of operation in the North Sea, Atlantic and Mediterranean is a little bit unfair because the American Navy obviously didn't get into the war until the end of 41 and beginning of 42, which means 39, 40, it's still, and most of 41, to be honest, their, well, their ships are still going to be almost in peacetime mode. Um, so it's a lot harder to say how everything would perform. But I wouldn't want to be operating American carriers in the Mediterranean, I can tell you that much. But on the other hand, the Bismarck probably isn't going to get very far because it's going to, the Battle of the Denmark Strait is more likely to be uh, 
a case of, well, we don't have any fast battleships ready at this point, because at this point, remember, North Carolina and Washington are only just coming online and everything else is a standard class. So you're going to be shadowed by cruisers, and then you're just going to find the skies darkening with sort of probably 200 odd aircraft coming in with uh, bombs and torpedoes, and that'll be the end of that. Nick asks in relation to uh, way back in the versus debate video when I talked about Algerie versus Admiral Hipper, uh, asks me to explain why I think the Algerie would have done a lot better than the Hipper, despite the Hipper weighing almost 50% more. One of the things is that in comparison, a lot of the Hipper's extra displacement simply comes from the fact that compared to the Algerie, it's over 50 foot longer, 3 foot wider, and sits 4 foot deeper in the water. So it just it's simply a much bigger vessel, and so it displaces more. It's not necessarily reflective of any greater um, fighting power. There's also the fact that for the extra knot in speed, the Hipper needs over 40,000 more shaft horsepower, and partially down to the sheer amount of power you need to get an extra knot at that kind of speed, and partly down to its hull form, which means its machinery and engineering spaces take up a lot more room, and obviously that in, it goes towards the displacement, but doesn't go towards any kind of uh, combat capability, uh, as a one knot speed difference doesn't really make much odds. So... Then, having taken all that into account, you start looking at the armament, and actually the two ships are very evenly matched. Hipper has uh, more torpedo launchers, but let's face it, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one cruiser duel and it comes down to torpedoes, something's already gone horribly wrong anyway. And beyond that, yes, the Hipper's guns technically have slightly better armor penetration um, due to their being 60 caliber as opposed to 50 caliber, and the shell design being slightly newer, but at the same time, the Algerie is significantly better protected. Algerie has a maximum belt thickness of 4.7 inches and a maximum deck thickness of 3 inches, as opposed to the Hipper's uh, deck thickness maximum of just under 2 inches and a belt of just over 3 inches. So broadly, the slightly better penetration of the Hipper's guns is going to be evened out by the Algerie's better protection, possibly with a slight advantage to Algerie due to the uh, significantly greater amount of protection, especially at uh, its effect at long distances, which means the Algerie might well have an immune zone, however slight, against the Hipper. And the final factor when you're looking just at sort of the broad overhead is the shells themselves, uh, quite apart from the fact that German AP shells in World War II seem to have a somewhat interesting time of trying to actually detonate. When you look at the shell that the Admiral Hipper's guns are using, uh, its bursting charge is 2.3 kilos uh, on the APC, whereas the bursting charge on the French shell is 8 kilos. So you're looking at just over six times the explosive firepower in the French shell, which means that for any given individual hit, a uh, French uh, APC shell is going to do a lot more damage, assuming the placement of the shot, etc., is about the same. So overall, the Hipper is a slightly larger target with slightly worse armor, and the French shell's going to do a lot more damage per individual hit, and all of that added together, I think, gives the Algerie the advantage, um, and it's that extra size of machinery space that contributes to most of Hipper's um, additional displacement, hence why the Algerie stands a better-than-even chance against the theoretically much larger ship. And on to the Discord questions, Curtis Boyer asks... Uh, what were the advantages dash disadvantages of oil fired boilers versus coal fired boilers? So basically, oil fuel held most of the advantages. It has a higher energy density, which means you get more power out of it for a given unit of weight. Um, there's a lot less uh, dirty uh, residue left over from its burning, so you have to clean the boilers, etc., a lot uh, less often. It's much easier to fuel, and it's much easier to uh, run the furnaces. You just adjust the valve, and how much oil gets sprayed on the furnaces changes, and stick a hose in, and you refuel the ship, as opposed to coal, where you have to shovel it into the furnaces all the time, and 
you have to physically lift the blasted stuff into the bunkers. Um, also, oil doesn't leave dust, highly flammable dust everywhere. So you might be thinking, so why didn't they use oil right from the start? Well, the single biggest weakness of oil is that compared to coal, it's found in very, very few places. Which meant that, well, even now, but especially in the early 20th century, securing your supply of fuel oil was something of a major problem. Um, one of the major issues that Germany had in the Second World War was the lack of fuel. Uh, same with the Italians, same with the Japanese. Basically, he who starts off controlling the seas can effectively strangle the person's who doesn't control the seas' uh, ability to resupply their fuel oil. Um, later on, obviously, you get synthetic processes and reserves and stuff, but they're not really going to sustain a full-time war economy. So coal is a lot easier to get your hands on. Even if it's not particularly brilliant quality coal, almost any nation will have some coal deposits that they can use. And the other thing with coal, as opposed to oil, is that being a solid physical object, uh, coal does have a certain degree of resistance, and tests in the late 19th, early 20th century showed that if you stacked the coal bunkers up against the armour plate on the inside of the ship, uh, approximately a foot of coal was equal to about an inch of armour plate, which lent a sort of useful secondary capacity, at least while the bunkers were full, in terms of extra armouring, um, which was always good. But that's basically the only two advantages of coal is availability and a slight increase in overall protection. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, oil's got pretty much all the advantages, but that rather crucial lack of availability is what hampered the adoption of oil-fired boilers in some navies for quite a while. Phoenix Jay-Z asks, uh, what made... Yarrow and Thornycroft boilers so different. Uh, he specifically points to the four Italian Zara class cruisers, three of which use Thornycroft boilers, whilst uh, Fume uses Yarrow boilers and, despite carrying a bit more fuel, has significantly worse uh, operational range because it burns fuel a lot quicker. So basically this comes down to the eternal battle between simplicity versus efficiency. The Thornycroft and Yarrow companies both competed for Admiralty uh, boiler contracts for the warships and obviously for foreign warships as well. And basically the Yarrow, class, Yarrow boilers were a simpler, more traditional three-drum boiler. And uh, I'm not going to go into the exact technical details because we'd be here all day, but you can see a few uh, some examples on screen. And... Uh, as you can see, it's relatively, for a boiler, a simple design, and uh, but it has a few efficiency issues compared to the Thornycroft boiler, which, as you can see, does the wonderful thing of adding an extra uh, drum, so it's uh, technically a four-drum boiler, but on a three-drum design, which allows it to get more efficiency out of its... Uh, out of the fuel that it burns to heat the water, but is obviously significantly more complex so and more expensive. So it's basically a case of, do you want to pay more for something that has a higher chance of breaking down and is going to be a lot more vulnerable to battle damage, but will give you more efficiency, or do you want to go with the slightly cheaper, slightly less efficient, but easier to repair um, design of the Yarrow boilers? And quite often, not just in the Italian Navy, but elsewhere, ships would compare between the two, uh, navies would compare between the two by installing the different boiler types on the same class of ship to see what they got. Um, to be honest, the, the uh, battle damage issue is less of an issue, because to be honest, if somebody's sent a shell down into your boiler rooms, you're probably stuffed anyway. Um, but, any, but in any case, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically going to say complexity versus efficiency. Uh, which is a sort of a repeating pattern across a lot of naval design. And Life Beyond Living asks, what was the thought process behind the United States Navy's adoption of cage masts instead of tripods? Well, I think I may have covered this elsewhere, but I, just to briefly recap, since this is a Discord question, it was effectively a case of survivability. Back when they were designed, it was thought that the fighting top 
wouldn't need that much beyond the actual person and maybe some basic range finding equipment. The idea of the cage mask was that by having it all lattice worked up like this, there wasn't any single target that a shell could detonate. Whereas with a tripod mast, the tripod setup was uh, thick enough that a shell could quite easily be initiated if it hit the mast. And with relatively few supports, if a shell blew out one of them, there's a very good chance you'd lose the mast entirely, at which point you've lost all your fire direction and control and spotting beyond anything you could spot from the turrets themselves. So, with a lattice mast being individual, within each individual bit of the lattice being relatively light, there was a good chance they might not set a shell off at all, and if a shell did pass through, it would just do that, it would pass through, it would make a small hole, but the overall lattice structure would stay up, which meant that your uh, observation platform was a lot more survivable. As it turned out, uh, the weight saving measures they had to put in in order for it not to be stupendously heavy compared to the tripod mast meant it was relatively weak and the additional fire control equipment that became necessary in the run up to and during World War I overstressed the lattice mast anyway so they proved quite vulnerable to vibration and flexing. Um, USS Michigan had a mast collapse and uh, eventually they redesigned it to a workable version which was much heavier in the Colorado class um, but eventually the US Navy did ditch them in favour of tripod masts, basically because tripod mast was better at supporting the heavy equipment that it had become necessary to install. Graf asks, um, could I talk about the Philadelphia experiment, however faulty the story might be? Okay, for the, so for those of you who don't hang around in conspiracy circles or are unfamiliar with the X-Files theme music, the Philadelphia Experiment is alleged to be a experiment, unsurprisingly enough, undertaken in the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard on the destroyer escort USS Eldridge, and it is claimed that variously that the ship was rendered invisible or possibly was teleported or sent to an alternate dimension or the crew was horribly afflicted by radiation basically they directed some form of energy wave at it and something weird happened to it the u.s navy of course maintains the whole thing is a hoax which obviously if it is a hoax they would uh, obviously maintain that because it would be true but let's be honest if they were conducting some sort of weird invisibility experiment, then of course they would also say it was a hoax because you wouldn't really tell anybody about that if it was true. But to lay out some more facts, the Eldridge commissioned in, Oct in August 1943, sorry, and the experiment was supposed to have happened in October 1943, which would mean that somebody falsified the Eldri Eldridge's war log because it doesn't make any reference to these kind of experiments. So... Um, someone's in a lot of trouble if uh, the experiment did happen because they're falsifying re uh, military records and of course there are the usual embellishments about time travel people being driven mad fusing into the hull of the ship etc etc so i mean apart from the highly fantastical nature of it all anyway um i think there, there's basically one very big elephant in the room that comes from all of this which is that given that most of the stories about it claim that the experiment was at least partially successful in making the ship invisible, dash teleporting it, dash time travelling it, etc. Even if it had bad effects on the crew, we have drones, we have had automated vehicles and weapons uh, for quite some time. So if in 1943 the United States Navy had somehow developed a way of turning something the size of a destroyer escort invisible or teleporting it to New York or teleporting it through time or whatever, I think the US would have used this technology at some point between then and now and given the lack of time travelling, teleporting, invisible robo-warriors laying waste to Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan or any of these other places where such eldritch technology might have been somewhat useful... I somewhat think that this probably didn't happen. Luke Freet asks if the Confederate States of America won the Civil War and remained independent in the Second World War, what would their fleet look like? Well, if we just sort of hand wave away, 
quite how they pulled that off in the first place. Um, given that you, it mentions that it remains independent as opposed to taking over the United States, that implies there's going to be the CSA and the USA, the Union up north, at which point, with an active hostile power on their land border, that means that both uh, nations' militaries are going to be a lot more heavily focused on ground forces, the army, etc., and later on the air force, than was the case historically, which is going to divert a lot of resources away from a navy. Um, but the navy that would come about would, again, be focused on the primary antagonist right across the border, so you're going to end up with a lot of riverine forces, coastal forces, um, maybe a few flagship show-off units, but the emphasis is going to be a lot more focused on a potential rematch with the Union than it is on any kind of ocean-going shenanigans. So you'd probably see the sort of monitor gunboat type uh, of ship advanced in technology and developed a lot more strongly, uh, shallow draft coastal battleships, um, destroyers and submarines would probably be taken up and developed quite quickly and radically, and uh, yeah, so... I mean, World War One, it might shake them out of uh, the this focus. I mean, even South American countries in World War One, by World War One, were building dreadnoughts. So I suppose both sides would probably be building their own dreadnoughts, but they would, you would probably be looking at dreadnought types that were still heavily focused towards close inshore work and maybe sacrificed range um, for that consideration because the sort of the the late. 19th century outlook that America had where what Navy it did have was looking at oceanic uh, work across the Pacific that focus probably isn't going to be on their minds when they're sort of staring daggers at each other over uh, over the border. Also given the greater total industrial potential of the Union the Union is probably going to have a fleet that's more balanced towards oceanic um, operations, the CSA is probably going to be the one who is going to be constantly looking for new and uh, wonderful weapons to try and even the balance cheaply, kind of like the French were doing to the Royal Navy in the latter part of the 19th century. So again, as I say, you'd see the CSA having lots of, sort of fast attack craft destroyers, torpedo boats and submarines uh, more than surface shipping. Wolf Dog asks, if the fleet at Pearl Harbor was notified about the sinking of the mini-sub a few hours before the attack, do you think the Pacific fleet would have mobilised, and if so, would they have sailed to attack the Japanese task force, and who would win? Well, the Japanese task force has a couple of battleships with it, but not enough to stand off the entire Pacific fleet, so if by some chance that did happen, the Japanese force would just sail away because they're faster. Um, but more practically speaking... Um, a few hours isn't going to be enough to get the Pacific fleet up and to speed. Bear in mind, these ships were generally, they're moored on battleship row. Most, a lot of them have their engines shut down. To get the engines fired up fuel um, and get the steam pressure up and get the ships moving, in a few hours, maybe one or two of them can. Uh, I mean, one or two did get moving during the attack itself, but that's because they were already on standby. The ones who were are basically on a cold start, they're probably not going to be in a position to get make themselves active in time. Um, and even if they, by some miracle, sort of crash start themselves into getting mobile, they're only going to be just exiting Pearl Harbor at the time of uh, the Japanese aircraft show up. So realistically, the best thing they can do if they're given that warning is come to full battle status, um, start the power-up procedure so that they've got more power for their pumps and uh, other things. But generally speaking, the main advantage they're going to get is having their crews all at full battle stations, have all the ammunition and the guns ready to go, fighter patrols up in the air, um, all the anti-aircraft batteries manned, as I said, etc., etc. Maybe some of the smaller ships could get round and be starting to do... Uh, patrols and such but you, given the time constraints you do not a you're not going to be able to find the japanese fleet because i say you don't a you don't know where they are b even if you did you couldn't catch them but the larger issue is that if you move the fleet out of pearl harbor you move it away further away from shore-based support albeit that the uh, fight fighters 
based on the island will probably be able to give you some cover. But realistically, um, if if the fleet is attacked and ships sink in Pearl Harbor, you can still recover them, as historically happened, unless they do an Arizona on you. Um, whereas if exactly the same situation happens out in the deep waters beyond the uh, harbor itself, those ships are gone for good. Um, which is a much worse outcome, and there's probably also going to be a lot more casualties. So... Best case scenario, everyone's waiting for the Japanese aircraft to arrive at Pearl Harbor. And finally, the Great King asks, how long do you think the Prince of Wales would have lasted if she was given tracer rounds and if the torpedo missed her propeller shaft? Well, a few more things need to be corrected as well, but taking the general gist of your statement, uh, basically fixing the minor issues uh, to try and affect a, a larger outcome. So assuming that the ammunition isn't falling apart and the HACS uh, high angle control system isn't uh, all fogged up, the if the if the pom-poms have tracer and that torpedo that hits the propeller shaft doesn't hit, possibly because the tracer rounds broke up the attack, it's marg It's actually notionally possible that Prince of Wales and Repulse survive, at least survive that day. Historically, about an hour after the ship sank, some fighters arrived over the battlefield, uh, friendly fighters that is, so that would have protected them if they'd managed to survive that long. And, to be honest, the Japanese attacked a little bit piecemeal because their aircraft were operating right at the edge of their range, so follow-up attacks would have taken a while, they would have had to get uh, the aircraft back home, they would have then had to refuel, rearm, head all the way back out again and find them again, possibly even pushing beyond their fuel range. Um, you look at Repulse's performance and it did a masterful job of dodging um, incoming torpedo and bomb attacks right up until it was caught in a pincer. So assuming that Prince of Wales uh, still has most of its anti-aircraft battery functioning, and that the various pom-poms and such are chucking out tons of tracer, the attacks are going to be punished more severely, um, they're going to be more likely to break up because of the incoming streams of tracer, which means that the pincer attack on Prince of on uh, Repulse sorry, is unlikely to fully manifest, which gives the Repulse a very good chance of dodging that uh, wave of torpedoes, at which point um, there aren't that many Japanese bombers left with uh, bombs and torpedoes to attack. The they they might still take a torpedo hit or two, but I'm fairly confident that given given the damage that was observed on the wrecks when they were initially discovered, one or two torpedo hits the ships can probably live with uh, and get away with. And as I say, if if they keep heading home then between the fighter cover and the more operational anti-aircraft, I don't think the Japanese can get another attack in that day that's going to have any significantly greater effect. Um, whether or not the ships would have lasted much longer beyond that is another question entirely, because the Japanese, as long as they don't lose too many aircraft, have the option of doing it again and again and again and again. Um, so the ships might well end up having to retire back pretty quickly if they don't want to get eventually sunk. But, yeah, as I say, given the operational circumstances, there there is a not definitive but reasonable chance that the ships might survive, albeit with damage. Uh, but it, to be honest, as we saw with that hit on the Prince of Wales, it's a bit of a coin toss with any given torpedo as to what exactly it hits. It could hit square on the torpedo defence system and barely trouble the Prince of Wales, or it could smash straight into a propeller shaft or something like that and do catastrophic damage. And with that, we wrap up this episode of the Trydoc. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you again on another video.